Hello everyone, Darren from Draytech Australia and New Zealand. In today's presentation we'll be looking at routing in Draytech routers. This will be the first of a two-part series and should help you to get a better understanding of routing and the configuration options available in Draytech routers. We'll start by looking at IP basics which will cover various aspects of IP addressing. Then we'll explain what routing is and what is involved in routing. We'll also look at the different types of routes used. In part two, we'll look at policy-based routing, load balance route policy, and diagnostic functions available in Draytech routers, and we'll check out some usage examples. Okay, let's start with IP basics. An IP address is a numerical label assigned to each device connected to a computer network using internet protocol, or IP, for communication. Every device in an IP-based network, including routers, print servers, and host PCs, needs an IP address to identify it, as well as its location on the network. In simple terms, the function of an IP address is to allocate a unique address to a device on a network so that any information that needs to be sent to it can reach it. We can use an analogy of sending a letter to a friend. You'll have an address on an envelope, which is similar to an IP address on a data packet. The letter goes through the postal service and finally is passed on to the postman who searches for the address written on the envelope and delivers it to your friend. This is similar to the way IP addresses are used on a data network to deliver data packets to the correct destinations. There are two versions of the internet protocol in common use on the internet today. These are IP version 4 and IP version 6. IPv4 was developed in the 1970s, and at the time it was thought to provide more than enough numbers to handle all the network devices in the world. However, since it uses 32 bits for addressing, this limited the number of possible IP addresses. With the expansion of the internet, it became apparent that the original assumptions were not correct, and we ended up with a shortage in the number of available IPv4 addresses. This was mainly due to the explosion in the number and range of IP-capable devices that are continuously being released in the market. An interim method was, and still is, to use NAT in routers, where a single public IP address can be shared by a large number of devices behind the router. But ultimately, we still needed more addresses, so IPv6 was developed, and since it uses 128 bits for addressing instead of 32, it allows a much, much larger number of IP addresses. So now it'll be possible for every device to have a unique IP address to connect to the internet directly. Here's just how many more IP addresses IPv6 gives us. So IPv4 gave us 32 bits or 4 octets of binary numbers, which equates to 4,294,467,295 unique IP addresses. With IPv6 we get 128 bits or 16 octets of binary numbers. That gives us, well, just a few more unique combinations. As we can see here, those 32 bits in IPv4 are written in groups of 4 octets, or 4 groups of 8 bits. We humans have a bit of trouble reading binary, which just uses two numbers, so it shows as long strings of just zeros and ones. So instead, we write the same numbers in decimal notation, which is much easier to read. For example, 172.16.254.1, instead of all those zeros and ones below it, which I won't bother reading out. An IPv4 address consists of two parts, the network component and the host component. The network component can be further broken down into subnets. For example, for the IP address shown here, we can see that it belongs to the 172.16.network. Within that network, for this example, the subnetwork component can have up to 254 possibilities. In this one, we have the subnet.254, and within each subnet, we can have up to 254 devices or hosts. Subnetting is a method to create a larger number of networks. When the internet was developed, IP addressing was first designed with no concept of subnets. The classification into A, B and C networks was done to accommodate large, medium and small networks. The table shown here shows the number of possible networks from each network class, A, B and C. A subnet mask is a method that is used to break down a subnet into smaller networks. A subnet mask is made by setting network bits to all ones and setting host bits to all zeros. The table here shows the subnet masks for class A, B and C networks and the leading ones for each subnet are in red. The subnet mask can also be used to subnet a network into smaller network segments. For example, a slash 29 subnet mask, that's 255.255.255.248, will have three host bits, so we'll give you eight IP addresses for each network. That's three lots of eight ones, followed by five ones and three zeros. 
It's important to note that there are two types of IPv4 addresses. These are public IP addresses, which are visible on the internet, and private IP addresses, which are reserved for private use. So on a router connected to the internet, we have a public IP address assigned to the WAN connection facing the internet, and then we use a private IP address range for the LAN side of the router. The NAT function in the router will translate the private IP addresses to the public IP address. Here we have the IP address ranges for each block of IP addresses reserved for private use, class A, class B and class C. Just like IPv4, there are different parts or groups of an IPv6 address. The network ID in this case is usually referred to as the global routing prefix and is the first three groupings of numbers used for routing. The subnet ID is the fourth grouping of numbers, that's the 49th bit through to the 64th bits. This identifies the subnet within a site and functions like a subnet field of an IPv4 address. The last part is the interface ID, it's the last 64 bits which act like the IPv4 host field. We won't go into more detail about IPv6 today, but if you're interested, check out our previous webinar titled Draytech IPv6 Solutions. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. Now let's look at what routing is. If we go back to our postal analogy, routing is similar to the postal service which takes your mail and routes it to its destination. Routers use a routing protocol to route data, that is selecting a path for traffic in a network or between or across multiple networks. In this diagram we can see the best path from the client to the server has been selected. A routing protocol specifies how routers communicate with each other and exchange routing information. There are three types, interior gateway protocols type 1, which are link state routing protocols such as OSPF and IS-IS. Interior gateway protocols type 2, which are distance vector routing protocols such as routing information protocol, that's RIP version 1 and version 2, and IGRP. Finally, exterior gateway protocols are used on the internet for exchanging routing information between autonomous systems. These include Border Gateway Protocol, BGP, and Path Vector Routing Protocol. This diagram gives us a brief illustration of how RIP, Routing Information Protocol, works. Routers learn routing information from directly connected neighbours, and these neighbours learn from other neighbouring routers. Each router sends a broadcast every 30 seconds with any routing updates. Neighbouring routers listen and update their routing tables when needed. BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, a description of BGP is that BGP is a standardised exterior gateway protocol designed to exchange routing and reachability information among autonomous systems, AS, on the internet. The protocol is often classified as a path vector protocol, but is sometimes also classed as a distance vector routing protocol. BGP is normally used for WAN connections for ISPs, universities or corporate networks. Here we have a diagram of a network using BGP. We have three autonomous systems, which could be corporate networks, and each peer is assigned an autonomous system number, ASN, which BGP uses to uniquely identify each system and exchange routing information between them. Routing decisions are made by using metrics to work out which is the best path for a data packet to take. Each routing protocol uses different metrics, for example RIP uses the number of hops or how many networks it must cross to reach the final destination. Other protocols may use the network bandwidth, delay, reliability, load or MTU in routing decisions. On large inter-networks, multiple routing protocols are commonplace. For example, there could be a mixture of static routes, RIP and OSPF routing protocols being used. So the question arises, which route will the router use to transport data? A solution is to look at the administrative distance for a particular route. The administrative distance is a number from 0 to 255 that indicates the reliability of the route source. The lower the administrative distance, the more reliable the source. The table here shows the administrative distance for each type of route source. A directly connected interface is the fastest and has an administrative distance of 0, followed by static routes. Each router maintains a list of preferred routes to different networks or hosts, which is called a routing table. The routing table here is from a bigger router. There are three parts highlighted. These are the destination IP plus subnet mask, gateway, and interface. The first column shows the type of route. 
C means connected, the WAN interface is directly connected to this IP address. S is for static, which is the route entry manually entered in the LAN static route setup menu. R means it's a route learned using RIP. B indicates BGP. You'll find BGP supported in the later model routers like the Vega 2865, 2927, 2962 and 3910. The asterisk sign is the default route, which is the default path to a destination if no other routes exist. And finally, the tilde sign means it's a private route. More on the default route. When a workstation needs to send data to a destination host or network, the router is usually involved in making the communication possible. And it does this using the settings in its routing table. If the router can't find the destination network in its routing table, then that destination will be unreachable. To help prevent that happening, a default route is configured to send all data packets for unknown destination networks to a particular interface. In the example here, all packets destined for unknown networks will be sent to WAN 1, 168.95.98.254. We'll now look at the types of routes. There are two types of routes. The first is static routes. These are manually configured in the router and are suitable for small networks. These are usually indicated by an S in the routing table. The other type is dynamic routes. These are routes learned from neighbouring routers and are suitable for larger networks such as the internet. They are indicated by the key R for RIP or B for BGP in the routing table. Routing information is derived from the default route, which is an entry covering all destinations, a direct connection, that is either WAN or LAN, a VPN connection, static routing, and dynamic routing. You can see some of those in the routing table shown here. Here's a configuration example where static routes are used. So we have two routers linked to each other and we want a PC on LAN A to communicate with a device on LAN C. LAN B is the common link between the two routers and static routes are used to specify the data path. To make it happen, we need to enter the static route details in each router. Here we have one static route configured in router A, which says that to go to the 172.16.2.0 network, we need to use the gateway 172.16.3.1, which is on LAN 2. Once it's configured, you'll be able to see the entry in the routing table as shown here. Another type of routing used in Draytech routers is inter-LAN routing. Inter-LAN routing allows communication between different subnets. This feature is useful if you want to allow communication between any two LAN subnets. For example, we may have a LAN subnet for the administration department configured as VLAN 1 and another LAN subnet for the sales department configured as VLAN 2 and we want to allow communication between these two departments. To allow that to happen, we enable inter-LAN routing between these two VLANs. Other departments such as the support department and the warehouse are not permitted access to the sales or administration networks, so we don't allow interlan routing for those. To do that in DreOS routers, go to the interlan routing menu, then select which LAN to route by clicking on the intersection of the two LANs to be routed. In this example, we're choosing the intersection between LAN 1 and LAN 2. In Linux-based routers such as the Vega 3900, 2960 and 300B, the menu options are different. By default, enabling routing will route between all VLANs. In the older firmware, we had to use firewall rules to stop routing to certain VLANs, but with more recent firmware versions, you can now select LANs to exclude from the routing. Dynamic routes dominate the internet and are routes that a router learns by using a routing protocol. The router learns the routes from neighbouring routers running the same routing protocols. Examples of dynamic routing protocols and algorithms include Routing Information Protocol, RIP, Open Shortest Path First, OSPF, Border Gateway Protocol, BGP, and Enhanced Interior Gateway Routing Protocol, EIGRP. Here we have a list of dynamic routing protocols supported in Draytech routers. RIP version 1 and 2 are supported in all routers. OSPF is supported in Linux-based router models such as the 3900 and 2960, as well as the Vega 3910 and Vega 2962 routers. BGP is also supported in Linux routers, and with the latest firmware it is also supported in the Vega 2862, 2865, 2926, 2927, 2962 and 3910 DreOS models. The other two protocols shown here, IS-IS -IS and EIGRP, are not supported in Draytech routers. 
The router automatically learns routing updates from the other routes and responds to changes. In the example shown here, when LAN C goes down, the route to LAN C will be removed from the routing table. If you'd like more information, there's a good overview describing the differences between static routes and dynamic routes in a YouTube video from Professor Messer titled, What is the difference between a static route and a dynamic route? I'll leave a link to it in the description below. It only goes for three minutes and is worth checking out. Okay, so once you've configured your routes, how can you quickly check that routing has been set up correctly to a certain destination? One simple way to check that routing is working as desired is to use the traceroute function as shown here. Traceroute shows the path that the data takes and helps to quickly verify that the routing has been set up correctly. To use it, open up a command prompt on your PC. To do that, just click on the search option at the bottom left of your screen in Windows 11 and type CMD. Then just type tracer, space, and whatever web server or IP address you like. We'll use google.com as an example. And enter. So the first hop is to my TPG supply router, then the TPG gateway, then we see some TPG routers, and then it changes to a different network, and we see more routers only identified by their IP addresses. Then finally the destination gateway. And that's it. So to summarize, we looked at IP basics and the differences between IPv4 and IPv6. Then we looked at what routing is and routing protocols. We also looked at the different types of routes, static routing, dynamic routing, and inter-LAN routing. Okay, that's all for now, but please stay tuned. We'll be answering questions in the live chat on the right of your screen for the next five minutes. For more information about Draytech products, please check out our website at www.draytech.com.au or send us an email to sales at draytech.com.au or give us a call on 02 9838 8899. Don't forget to like and subscribe below and if you'd like a notification anytime we put up a new video, please give the bell a click too. Thanks and bye for now.